Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, and welcome to John Tillian's home. We're so excited to be here tonight to share this presentation with you. And uh, what we'd ask you to do is we're going to show the presentation now. And in the comments section below, you can write any questions. At the conclusion of the video, we'll have a guest session and you can ask your questions um, through the comments and then we'll ask them to the presenters. So we ask that you do that. And here we go. Good afternoon and welcome to Heinz History Center. My name is Chaz Bowers and I'm the Dean of the Pittsburgh Chapter of the American Guild of Organists. I'm both honored and humbled to welcome you as we begin our chapter's centennial celebration. When we think about our chapter 100 years ago, they would have been just ending the Spanish flu. And when we look at the wonderful work that our chapter founders began and continued to this day, we can't help but be inspired. We're all sad that we can't gather together due to the coronavirus. However, when we look at their work, we know that we should continue to carry the torch of our beloved chapter for the next 100 years. Congratulations, welcome, and I'm happy to introduce now Ken Danchik, our subdean. Now we will take a journey back in time, 100 years to the founding of our Pittsburgh AGO chapter. Three of our chapter's loyal and knowledgeable members, Frank Kurtig, Barbara McElway, and Suzanne Gilliland, will talk about important documents and memorabilia kept here in the Heinz History Center, recalling the members and events that have shaped our chapter over the years to become one of the most active and important chapters in our guild. Fasten your seatbelts. Let's get started. Good evening. My name is Frank Kurtick, and I am a member of the Pittsburgh chapter of the American Guild of Organists, a fairly new member. I've only been with the chapter for about four years. Uh, and I'm not an organist myself, but I represent uh, Heinz Memorial Chapel, the organ program there, at the University of Pittsburgh, and the uh, Reuter Opus 2176 that we have in the chapel. Having a virtual chapter meeting is uh, a new and different thing for all of us. However, I feel this current technology that makes it possible for us to gather together electronically would pique the interest, if not approval, of our founding dean, Charles Heinroth. After all, he was an early adopter of technology. In July of 1921, attendees of the 14th Annual Convention of the National Association of Organists in Philadelphia got to hear Dr. Heinroth play, even though he was at the organ console at the Carnegie Music Hall in Oakland, over 300 miles away. How? To the miracle of what the newspapers of the time termed a wireless telephone, which we simply know today as the radio. That was 99 years ago this summer, at the time that he was working toward establishing this chapter. He was also the, to the first to perform on an electric radio organ, live on K2K radio in 1930. That was a Westinghouse invention in which organ pipes were replaced by oscillating vacuum tubes. Yes, our founding dean would likely have fit in and embrace our technology, but I'm getting ahead of the story. And for that matter, what was the National Association of Organists? And how was Dr. Heinroth Roth involved with it? Even though the American Guild of Organists was 12 years older, having been founded in 1896, the NAO had enough local members to have a national convention in Pittsburgh in 1919. I'm not gonna say that uh, organists at that time were made of sturdier stuff than today, but uh, a headline here caught my attention and reporting of that, that event. Uh, uh, an organist got a broken jaw in an auto accident that day, but he still persevered and played his recital for that convention. 
Another newspaper heading that caught my attention was uh, this one, in which uh, uh, there was a claim that low attendance at, at church services was due to poor playing. Now, while that's a highly charged statement, it does bring us to why the American Guild of Organists came to exist at all and why certain Pittsburgh organists want to establish a chapter here. In 1894, a New York City organist and music professor, Garrett Smith, spent his summer in England and learned of the college, Royal College of Organists. He was taken with this purpose as a central organization for organists to foster sacred music studies, encourage composition of church music, and maintain high standards among organists through the administration of exams. The NAO, in contrast to the AGO, shared some of those aims, but was more of a fraternal body, and did not foster examinations. Even after the founding of our chapter, some were dual NAO and AGO members, but eventually the NAO merged with the AGO, and that was in 1935. Interestingly, two NAO members, Dr. Charles Heinroth and Charles N. Boyd, were the prime movers in establishing this chapter. Dr. Heinroth came to Pittsburgh in 1907 to take up the demanding and prestigious position as organist and director of mu music for Carnegie Institute. Mr. Boyd, since 1903, was instructor of church music at the Western Theological Seminary, and in 1915, co-founder of the Pittsburgh Musical Institute. Now, nowhere are their, are their personal aims stated. But fostering high standards among local organists was obviously a principal objective. The record of the first meeting to consider establishing an AGO chapter here is rather cut and dry and to the point only. Nothing about the philosophy of intent or statement of goals. No, on May 17, 1921, quote, a meeting of the organists of Pittsburgh and vicinity was held at Carnegie Institute to discuss the idea of local American Guild of Organs chapter. Before adjourning for that Tuesday evening in Oakland, they did consider the names of either Pittsburgh or Western Pennsylvania for their proposed chapter. A second organizational meeting was held a month later on Tuesday, June 14, beginning 8.15 in the evening inside Carnegie Music Hall with 35 attendees. Most significantly, John Hyatt Brewer, uh, he was president of the Guild's creation in 1896, uh, formally installed a chapter of the Guild that evening. Mr. Brewer was a past warden. That position title was changed in 1949 to president, as in the title that uh, Michael Bedford now holds. And in 1902, was also present in Philadelphia for the installation of the uh, uh, filled up the Pennsylvania chapter of the American Guild of Organists. Incidentally, the name of that chapter might have been why ours is based on geography as the Western Pennsylvania chapter to distinguish it from the Pennsylvania chapter. The members on the other end of the state uh, kept their name until 1960 when it was changed to the Philadelphia chapter, just as ours was changed two years earlier to the Pittsburgh chapter. Very importantly, before closing for the evening, another official spoke to the assembled group, and that was Oscar Franklin Comstock, the AGO's general secretary, who discussed the importance of examinations. All that was left was for Mr. Brewer to appoint officers and the executive committee. As dean, he named Charles Heinroth, subdean Albert Reeves Norton, secretary Earl B. Collins, and treasurer Casper Koch. For the executive committee, he named Joseph Otten, William H. Edding, William K. Steiner, John A. Bell, Reinhardt Mayer, Esther Prue Wright, Charles N. Boyd, Harvey B. Gall, and Nora Ditzler Miller. 99 years ago, yesterday, September 27, 1921, our chapter had its first regular meeting. 
the, the principal business that day was to uh, nominate three women as colleagues, Mary Valentine, Janet Martin, and Adelaine Merrill Biddle. This brings up the fact that unlike a number of other organizations and institutions of the time, women were active in our AGO chapter as members and officers. Of the total 30 charter members, 12 were women and two women were members of the initial executive committee. It was not until 1942 that Madeline uh, Emich became the first woman, woman to serve as chapter dean, but she was followed by eight other women in uh, that position over the next decades, including Barbara McCalloway, who you'll be hearing later. Before that first meeting of the 1921-22 season concluded, it was decided that Dean Heinroth would appoint a program committee, a very necessary body for, for this chapter to this day. Joseph Otten, who was organist and choir master at St. Paul's Cathedral, invited his fellow guild members to mass uh, on Thanksgiving morning in, in that 21-22 season. While this was the first event uh, for members of the chapter, the chapter's first public service was held at Temple Rodaf Shalom on Fifth Avenue in Oakland. At the invitation of organist and director of music, William K. Steiner. And thus, I believe uh, this is the first printed program of any concert recital of the chapter. At this point, I think it's worthwhile to uh, read the objectives of the Guild as it was printed on the back of this program. Quote, to raise the standards of efficiency of organists uh, by examination in organ playing, in the theory of music, and in general musical knowledge, and to grant certificates of fellowship and associateship to members of the Guild who pass such examinations, to provide members with opportunities for meeting, for the discussion of professional topics, and to do such other lawful things as are incidental to the purpose of the Guild. Those are wonderful high ideals, but now I want to turn our attention to the day-to-day -day concerns of running an organization. Dinners have always been an important feature of our meetings, so I have this to share with you from uh, our second season. In the minutes for December 19, 1922, we read, quote, it was suggested when possible, dinner should be held preceding guild meetings, uh, possibly because uh, someone's full stomach uh, might not off, but uh, no reason was given. That, that may have been a practical concern. Also on that occasion, another uh, matter of procedure was, was called for. A roll call should be made at every meeting. Uh, the former is something we still practice. The latter fell by the wayside. Numbers of members attending meetings can be inconsistent, but the December 1924 meeting got a comment in the minute book from John Groth, a young Carnegie Tech student. Counting only seven members, including himself, he wrote, quote, the attendance is disgraceful, but we had a good time even if our numbers were small. Membership issues crop up from time to time in the minutes, such as recorded in an executive committee report of September 21, 1925. Quote, the feelings of the committee in regard to increasing the chapter membership and concerning the rotation scheme and selecting meeting nights were sought and obtained new members to be carefully selected. Hmm, Se seems like a cautionary tale there somewhere. On the other hand, welcome praise can come out of the blue. At the September 1925 meeting, a letter was read from Trinity Cathedral organist and choir master, Harold D. Phillips. Quote, mentioning the high standard of organ playing and program making in Pittsburgh as compared to cities in England, which he had just visited. Perhaps the high standard of the Royal College of Organists were not as influential as they had been three decades earlier when Garrett Smith visited, or maybe Mr. Phillips, as a Pittsburgher, was just not all that objective about his assessment. In 1926, there was more about dinners. Quote, a discussion concerning the price to be paid for our frequent dinners ensued, and it seemed to be the sense of the meeting that guild funds should not be used for such a purpose, even to defray extra expense beyond $1 per plate 
and that 150 should be the maximum price considered. Along with paying for dinners, the accompanying perennial issue is knowing how many will be present for dinners. Along that line, we hear with this from, the, from November 1934, quote, our dean also reminded us just to be a little more accurate in returning your reply cards to the secretary. Membership directory, well, we still have a membership directory, but it's an electronic form. In the 90s, 1920s and 1930s, there was a mimeograph version. Who remembers the mimeograph? Minutes for September 1927 show that the actual printing of the membership directory was suggested, but it was moved and seconded to mimeograph a list instead. That cumbersome method of making copies came up again in 1931, when the motion was made at the October meeting for mimeographing and mailing the membership directory. However, in the November meeting, that process was, quote, to be held over until such time as the chapter was in better financial condition. That last comment is an understatement of the fact that this is the beginning of the era of the Great Depression. By the way, I only found one instance of the use of the term in the minutes. That was in the February 1932 minutes about, quote, the difficulty in selling tickets in this time of depression. Even with that hardship all around, that did not stop members from wanting to host a national AGO convention in Pittsburgh. The records show that the idea first surfaced in an executive committee meeting on November 23, 1931. Paul Burns, convention manager for the Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, was invited to attend the meeting as the chapter discussed hosting this the 1933 national convention. Committee members were no doubt pleased to learn that the Chamber of Commerce of Pittsburgh was going to take care of all publicity printing and postage costs for promoting the event. However, the 1933 event went to Cleveland, and our chapter members had to regroup. They were successful in lining up the one and only AGO National Convention, the 15th. Um, the first was in New York City in 1914. Here, the week of June 22 through 26 in 1936. This is an article that was in the Pittsburgh Press of uh, Monday, June 22, 1936, by the, the uh, very accomplished uh, music writer of the Pittsburgh Press, Ralph Luando. We are very fortunate to uh, have a copy of the convention program. Uh, I believe it actually might be two copies in very good condition. Um, I'm going to show here a page of uh, events of, uh, of Tuesday, June 22nd. And I put this here because it has a great aerial view of the heart of the area where the convention took place. Uh, the Oakland District of Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Civic Center, going from the convention hotel, the Hotel Shenley, and Carnegie Music Hall, the principal venue uh, for that convention. Um, now, the first con uh, organ concert at the convention was fittingly in Carnegie Music Hall and was performed by Marshall Bidwell, who had recently come to Pittsburgh from Iowa to succeed Charles Heinroth, who left for the City College of New York. The first three works on this program were by Bach, but the third was a contemporary piece by a chapter member, the finale from Har Harvey Gall's Sinfonia Liturgica. Perhaps as a matter of logistics, but the other Carnegie Hall one built by Andrew Carnegie for Allegheny City, now the north side of Pittsburgh, was not used as a, as a site for a convention concert. However, holding forth there in a series of free public events, uh, public concerts, just as Marshall Bidwell did at uh, 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 Carnegie uh, Music Hall in Oakland, uh, following a lineage of organists, going to the very first in 1895 uh, by Frederick Archer. Dr. Koch, seen here at the left, it's Marshall Bidwell to, to the right. Casper uh, uh, Koch received an honorary doctorate from Duquesne University in 1922, the year after 
Charles Heinroth was awarded one from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Koch had been an organist in Pittsburgh for nearly three decades at this point. He was born in Germany in 1872. His family emigrated to the United States in 1881 and settled in Alton, Illinois. Following his studies, his first organ position was at Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church, now St. Benedict the Moor, in Pittsburgh's Hill District. In 1904, he was named municipal organist for Allegheny City, again, before it merged into Pittsburgh in 1908. And later he joined the music faculty of what was known in his time as Carnegie Institute of Technology, now Carnegie Mellon University. Now, just as uh, Dr. Koch came from the Midwest, from Illinois, uh, the Midwest uh, also yielded uh, another great organist at the time, uh, Marshall Bidwell, who, who I had just mentioned. Now, in truth, he was a New Englander by, by birth, uh, but by this time he had been living and working in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, where he taught at Coe College and was also a municipal organist. He was a graduate of the New England Conservatory of Music and studied in France with Charles Marie Vidor. In November 1929, minutes uh, of an executive committee note that, quote, they recommended that we invite Mr. Bidwell to play in the North Side Carnegie Hall and each member to pay $2 to cover his expenses and other expenses of the recital. Just a couple of months later, he was there. The review by William R. Mitchell in the Pittsburgh Press of January 31 gave this account. And by the way, I'll show you the uh, Carnegie Music Hall of Oakland. I'm oh, sorry, the North Side. Yes, we have two Carnegie Halls. Uh, library to the left, the music hall, the right, the organ, uh, which uh, Dr. Koch played, in which Marshall Bidwa played his first concert in Pittsburgh. The review by William R. Mitchell in the Pittsburgh Press of January 31, 1930, gave this account. Quote, last night's program on the auspices of the Western Pennsylvania chapter, American Guild of Organists, opened with a Bach Toccata and Fugue in D minor, followed by an air from the same master's pen, a Gluck Gavat de Lager Vivace from Vidor's Fifth Symphony, the Karg Art Claire de Lune, a B minor canon by Schumann, Franck's A minor chorale, and Sunrise from Jacob's Burgundy Hours came next in order. It concluded with the scherzo from Vidor's first, uh, Fourth Symphony, the prelude to the Debussy's The Blessed Damozelle, and the Moulet Allegro, Thou Art the Rock. As an encore, the love death from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde was played. Marcia Bidwell was a hit and eventually was tapped to succeed Charles Heinroth as organist and director of Carnegie Institute. The Institute is this massive complex here. The music hall is to the right here with the library behind it. And the appearance of the music hall, the organ console and pipe facade at the time uh, of Marshall Bidwell taking up there. He served as organist and director of music of Carnegie Institute, remaining in Pittsburgh to his death in 1966, at which time Casper Koch's son Paul succeeded him. In the same year, as Pittsburgh's National AGO Convention, another organist arrived to make a triumphant of organist of the Midwest, who had a great impact on Pittsburgh's musical life. This was Russell Wickman, a graduate of Lawrence University in his native Wisconsin, and also of Union Theological Seminary. On the evening of Tuesday, October, 10, 1936, he was installed as organist and music director of the Shadyside Presbyterian Church, succeeding Earl Mitchell. Mr. Wickman came the first organist of Hines Memorial Chapel and as a member of Pitt's music department, the first university organist. He served as dean of our chapter from 1941 through 1942. By the end of that term, he entered another service, military. For three and a half years, Mr. Wickman served 
as a warrant officer. Um, uh, with the 4th Infantry Division as a band leader. He and the band members actually land at Utah Beach 14 days after D-Day. Discharged on December 7, 1945, he was awarded five battle stars and the Bronze Star. Now, while he left Pitt less than two years after his return from World War II, he remained in Pittsburgh to serve as professor and chairman of the music department of Chatham College, now, now university, as well as, well as organist and director of music at Shadyside Presbyterian Church, continuing in the latter position until 1987, the year of his death at 75. Now, these are just short accounts of uh, just three chapter members from the past. We have a rich history filled with so many talented individuals who gave so much of their musical lives here over the decades. Going back again, chapter history, the first major figure solicited to perform here soon after it's founded was Marcel Dupre in 1922. And he came at the invitation of the chapter more than once over the next three decades. Uh, one of the early uh, special programs assembled by members was uh, 1923 to commemorate the centenary, the birth of César Franck. At the Church of Ascension, 1930, an all Vidor program was held. In 1927, Canadian organist Linwood Farnham was the next major figure to be invited by the chapter, followed by the great success of the concert by Siegfried Karl Ellert in 1932, a year before Ellert's death. Uh, there was also Floor Peters in 1946, E. Power Biggs in 1947, and, and well, Virgil Fox, 1949. This photo is from an original in the uh, chapter's archives at the uh, History Center. Uh, sorry about the shading, uh, but, but some things are in great condition, some are not. This, this does show age and wear. We'd love to have a pristine copy. As I mentioned, yes, E. Power Biggs. Uh, performed here at the invitation of the chapter in 1947. Um, and note here, this was a benefit concert. It's a benefit for the Boyd Memorial Library Fund. Charles N. Boyd, as you may have recalled from my beginning remarks, was a co-founder of our chapter, along with Dr. Charles Heinroth. In 1937, he collapsed as or at his organ in the Pittsburgh Musical Institute on Delford Avenue and died at the age of 61. The building is long gone. Uh, it stood, here's the building itself, it stood on uh, Belfield Avenue above uh, Fifth Avenue, just uh, uh, behind was not Pitt's music department. Long gone, it's been replaced by a great uh, a reinforced concrete behemoth that now serves as Pitt's library school and information service, uh, sciences uh, department. And by the way, the uh, music department, uh, PMI, was absorbed by Pitt's music department. Uh, and this is the, the mid-1960s. Uh, at the end of, uh, at the time of uh, Mr. H uh, Boyd's death, one of his students was a young black man by the name of Billy Strayhorn, to whom he was teaching music theory and composition. And I'm sure that name is known to all of you out there. He became one of the great jazz greats of, of his era. Mr. Boyd had a vast music library, and his friends mounted an effort to purchase it from his estate and make it available for use by its students and public. Um, this library today forms the sizable core of the music division of Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, just behind Carnegie Music Hall, where our chapter was founded. For a number of years, benefit concerts were held to support the, the work of the music division. Collections of materials such as that of Charles N. Boyd have lasting value for what they tell you about our past and ourselves. In a centennial year such as this, it is natural to look back and reflect our chapter has done that at times as, as well. 
In our very first year, Albert Reeves Norton gave a history of the Guild going back to its 1896 founding. In 1946, George N. Tucker read a history of the chapter for its 25th anniversary. Three years later, in 1948, Julian Williams sat down and compiled a list of chapter highlights over the 28 years. Then in 1991, for the 70th anniversary of the, uh, arc the chapter, an archives committee was formed. Thanks to the efforts of uh, people such, especially the late Norris Stevens, Franklin Watkins, and Mary Weber, materials were rescued. They were so important to research that Susie, let me show this picture, in, at work, our, our research, our 100th anniversary presenters tonight uh, at work in the archives. Um, so that uh, Susie here and Barbara, so that we, we could gather material to, to make this presentation tonight possible. Um, and, and that's the only reason they're here is thanks to the fore, foresightedness and, and thoughtfulness of, uh, notably, it was the, the late Reverend uh, George Tuttenweiler. Uh, and these records were donated or made deposited in the archives of Stork Society through the efforts of uh, uh, Mr. Tuttenweiler along with uh, 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 David Grinnell, who was chief archivist of the historic society at that time. Uh, and this was the time when Larry Allen was, was dean. So it was, we thank all of those involved at the time for making, or else we may not have this possible. Now before I turn the 1950s over to Susie, I'll close out my third decade, the, my portion of the chapter's history, with this wonderful photograph um, uh, that, that shows our chapter, uh, about 100 members of the chapter visiting the Moeller factory in Hagerstown, Maryland in 1948. It was a big event, uh, one of the, maybe the first big field trip of the chapter. Um, and this is a photograph that appeared on the front page of the Dive Hazen, May 1, 1948. Thank you for your kind attention. And we'll move on to the 1950s with Susie. Good evening. My name is Susie Ann Gilliland. Everybody knows me as Susie Gilliland. I have been a member of the Pittsburgh chapter of the American Guild of Organists uh, for several years. Um, before me, uh, probably most all the older members of the chapter knew my father, Dale Gilliland, who was a uh, the treasurer, the uh, begins uh, helped with Pipe Organ Academy and various other duties that he had over the years. And that's how I got involved with the Organ Guild. Also, here we're taping at the Heinz History Center. I am a docent and as well as a volunteer archivist at the Library and Archives. And to continue our story about the Guild Archives, they were brought here in 2009 uh, after we picked them up from Norris Stevens. Um, and we brought them to the archives here and we have been processing them and collecting them over the years. As you see, I have posters beside me on my left side and these are photos of actual archives that you can view up in our library and archives uh, section. So we'll be talking about a few of those as I continue on with the 1950s. The first meeting in the year of 1951 um, in the October 21st. They started in the evening, four o'clock, really early for a guild. But we started at a stained glass factory of Leo Potassi's, which was up on Penn Avenue. His daughter, Laura, who attended Oberlin Conservatory in a music major with a minor in organ, designed uh, stained glass windows. So when you are uh, going to the spring meeting at the Church of the Assumption in Bellevue, take a look at the windows on the side aisles and you will see some of her works. After they visited the glass uh, factory, then the guild meeting that night, we had a young lady, Mildred Schmertz, from Carnegie Tech who studied architecture and she talked to the guild members about uh, the architecture of the uh, Sacred Heart Church in, Shade in Shadyside. 
to finish the evening off, the members of the, the men's choir at Sacred Heart um, performed Flor, Flor Peter's work, Te Deum, in Allegro, the fir, in the first trio of the sonatas by Bach. As we continue on with the Guild year that year, we went, we had our, a joint meeting with the Wheeling chapter. And it, as we even continue today, we have joint meetings such as with the Seton Hill chapters and um, some of the other chapters that have now come into our chapter, such as the Wheeling chapter. On January 28th, we had hosted um, Ted Ripper hosted the Brentwood Presbyterian Church um, in a program which showed how a volunteer choir and a home modeled Hammond organ, what makes an enthusiastic musician can do with limited means. I thought that was, I didn't have a, a lot of detail about that meeting, but I thought a lot of us have grown up with Hammond organs when we were younger, in the younger years, I thought you might enjoy that. Uh, our first, um, in the 1951 season, sponsored East Liberty Presbyterian Church had Dr. Herbert Held as one of the recitalists this year. In the final meeting of the year, we uh, had, which was held at Third Presbyterian Church, uh, we had Lois Finke, she was a pupil of Catherine Crozers and Harold Gleason, as well as Fred Henry, who was a pupil of Arthur Polsler, uh, do recitals for the members of the guild. Now, as I was working, doing some or archival research, we are missing several letters. Dean letters is how our newsletters started out at the beginning, and then they went into the pan pipes. But it's summertime for the Guild. In the summer of 1953, Russell Wickman and the Mendelssohn Choir, which he directed, performed at Chautauqua, Vaughn Williams's Dona Nobis Pachem. In the fall, we started with our new, our new Dean, Horace Hollister, uh, he reminded each guild member that the chapter meetings are the fourth Monday of every month, as they still are, except if a holiday falls in. But remember this, and it's even true today. The guild needs you, and you need the guild. On Sunday, December 27th, the Northside Community, uh, Carnegie Hall had a honored Casper, Dr. Casper Koch as his retirement. The following uh, Sunday, January the 3rd, uh, we had the first recital of the new city organist. You probably maybe have known him. His name was Paul Koch, who was Casper's son. Following the retirement of his dad, some of us wonder uh, some of the pieces that Paul Koch played. Well, here's a little tidbit of information for you. One piece he played was Bach's D minor toccata and fugue, which was played by his father in his first recital in March of 1904. David Craighead was a recitalist at the Church of the Ascension this year. Letters were sent out to, for the young organist competition. And the winner would receive $100 and a round trip transportation to all roads lead to the Twin Cities, which is where National Convention was that year in 1954. The 1954 summer pipelines, uh, there was a letter from Dean Hollister. There was a young lady in our chapter, you may know her. Dean Hollister asked, would you please cooperate with Minabel Packard? who is, was doing her work at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, who's writing her thesis on the growth of the church music in Pittsburgh. Don Wilkins was the newly appointed organist and choir director at Calvary Episcopal Church and the director of the Bach Choir. He uh, will speak on French organ and organ playing at the Guild meeting. As you can see in our one example here, 
This is the program from the Friends of the Organ, the Carnegie Organist um, in the Music Library. And we were asking, the Vatican organist was playing a recital, Fernando Germani. Every guild member was sent tickets. The tickets were $1, and each guild member was given five to sell. In our chapter newsletters each month, they listed new members that were joining. Perhaps um, in the newsletter that was decided, um, dated December 10th, 1954, a person that I know very quite, I know very well had joined. His name was Dale Gilliland, my dad. New Year's dues changed. Dues always have changed, even to today. They changed from the dues for a regular member, that would be a, a organist or a choir director, to $3.75 for the year. Pittsburgh Exania Seminary played host to the Guild meeting on February 12th. Special recognition was given to all members who had joined since September 1st, 1954. A tour of the building was given and a recital was held uh, afterwards. On April 25th in Butler, Pennsylvania, see, we went to Butler back then, uh, an organ recital by Dr. Russell Wickman was held on the new Mueller uh, organ that they had, 46 ranks, 2,601 2, pipes, two consoles at St. Mark's Lutheran Church. As we continue on, we're, we have our new dean in um, 1955 to 56, Nan Clark Neuenbauer. She was our dean. We were on the road again. Yes, we are. Here you can see members boarding the bus to the Holt Camp Organ Factory in Cleveland, Ohio. Organ uh, was demonstrated by Walter Bulgett, and the day concluded with a recital by Mr. Bulgett. So here, they're leaving right here from the Greyhound bus station that day. To continue with uh, our growth in our chapter, we have had several different students groups that have joined over the years. In the fall of 1956, uh, there was a new student group that was held. It was the Butler Area Joint High School Guild. Uh, presentations and ceremonies were held at the home of Dr. Lamont Crape, who is the supervisor and instructor of organ for Butler Area Joint High School. Some of you might know this person, Carolyn Slaw, Carolyn Ferguson Slaw. She was successfully passed her AAGO com, uh, e exam. Uh, membership at this point, we had 352 active members, 28 subscribers, and three dual members. Our new dean, James Evans, started in 1957-58 season. His motto of the year was try something new. Maybe we should chart that again, try something new for our centennial year. Maybe a new piece, maybe, uh, some new um, activity that you'd like to do. The big, one of our big markers in the 50s that we had, and you can see right in the center here, uh, the photograph there, but you can see it for yourself up in Library and Archives, was on May 26, 1958, at the executive meeting, Subdean William Lindbergh announced our new official name of the Pittsburgh chapter of the American Guild of Organists. Also 1958 was a special time for us in the city of Pittsburgh. It was our bicentennial. We were 200 years old. Uh, our opening meeting was held at the Western Theological Seminary Chapel. We now know it as Pittsburgh Theological uh, Seminary today. The program was early Western Pennsylvania hymns and hymn tunes. The booklet, um, and it was co collected and edited by Mr. Evanson, and the music settings were by Roll Lammer, and here's a copy of what it looks like. It has a blue cover. Uh, Mr. Lammer was at the Church of the Ascension at that point. Also, in December of 1957, the Pittsburgh chapter 
commissioned three works for three anthems for the Pittsburgh Bicentennial. A special thank you goes to Alan Lewis for providing us with a copy to add to our archivals. Uh, and the three anthems were Hendrik Anderson's Laudate Deum, Clifford Taylor's O Sing Unto the Lord, and Isidore Fries Psalm 122. They were performed that night on December 17th at the meeting at First Baptist Church. On February 15th, all stops were pulled out at the Carnegie Music Hall on the north side as the Pittsburgh chapter of the American Guild of Organists honored the free organ recital series that had been going on. And Paul Koch, who was the city organist at the point. Presentations were made to Mr. Koch and the city of Pittsburgh. Sixth Presbyterian was the setting of our guild meeting where Leo Sotherby was the guest conductor that night for his work of Cantile of the Sun. As we continue on, we're, we're just going down the road here. We're gonna go into the 1960s. Our dean now is William Lindbergh. As you can see, uh, we have some of the programs we had in, in the 1960s. John Weaver was a recitalist for the, uh, the Guild program in October. John had performed at the Williamsport Regional Convention, and many of us know John as the years have uh, gone on that he's played. Um, on November the 1st, Dr. Marshall Bidwell played a program commemorating the opening of the Carnegie Library and Music Hall, as well as the inauguration of the historic series of organ recitals uh, during the week of November 3rd, 1895. The program consisted numbers played by Mr. Frederick Archer, Dr. Heinroth, and Mr. Lamare at their opening recitals. This was part of the Pittsburgh Bicentennial Collection. Charles Pearson was honored by Rodolphe Shalom for being there for 35 years. As you can see in the upper uh, corner here, the, for the about a period of five years, there was um, church music seminars, which were held at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And a lot of the times, the series, is, they would run for several, uh, about approximately six weeks in time, but they ran for several years. One thing that our newsletters included were birth announcements, uh, children's, and unfortunately, we even included deaths that we still even do. When I was doing my research, it was kind of fun, and I, I came over a little announcement, and it said, Dale Gilliland married Betty Lou Douglas on October 1st, 1960. So this would have been my parents' 60th wedding anniversary this year. November uh, 1st, we started with programs on junior choirs, and we had Madeline Ingram speak with us at Emory Methodist Church. Well, December, we have our parties, and this left no doubt. The First Baptist Church, Nan around town, with the humor and satire of our past dean of Nan Nuremberg. Harold Schreibel, who just passed away a couple years ago, uh, spoke on music uh, for the small church organ in February of 1961. Uh, and over on this side, you can see Francis Jackson, organist and uh, master of music at York Minster, appeared in Mount Lebanon United Presbyterian Church. We had another road trip. This one was to the Mueller uh, organ factory. The Muellers hosted them for a tour of the factory, provided dinner for them, and Ernest White played a recital on one of the newly installed Mueller organs. Playing uh, service playing certificates in the fall of 1961, uh, William Lindbergh had earned his uh, certificate. One, one of the <clears throat> May meetings that we had, Alec Lighton, who was now the national president of the American Guild of Organists, came to demonstrate different sections of the choir master exam and the AAO, 
AAGO exam with some helpful hints on how to prepare for it and how to successfully uh, pa pass the exam. Over in the uh, bottom right corner, you can see this right red uh, bulletin here. This is the von Beckerath organ at St. Paul's Cathedral. The first time it was played was December 8th, 1962 in public. Dr. Lord on April the 8th of, had just come to Pitt from uh, Davidson's College and he was featured in recital at that me meeting. Mr. William Odering joined the ranks of honorary member. The other honorary member that we had was Casper Koch at that time. All right, you all are attending the November 25th meeting. Well, Paul Koch discussed the new von Beckerath organ at St. Paul's Cathedral. Guess what? You were up in the consult, so you always, all of you climbed 41 stairs. Uh, Maurice Doroflay was here for a recital on J June the 30th. And on February 22nd of 1965, we traveled to the St. George uh, Syrian Orthodox Church for the expo explanation of Orthodox Church music. Also on May 25th, Role Lamer uh, program for the guild was you too can write a hymn tune. So encourage, I'm encouraging each one of you to write a hymn tune. The regional convention, you can see here, and the one that we have, we have a couple copies of this upstairs, uh, and the name written on it was Deidre Watkins, um, was held. The uh, Headquarters was Pitt Campus. It would cost you a whole $28.50, everything including included transportation. And a husband or a wife of an organist was only $12. Some of the venues was the Carnegie Music Hall in Oakland, the American Wind Symphony Barge, the um, St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, and there was two two um, workshops, one choral workshop, which is given by Dr. Paul Calway of National Cathedral in Washington, DC. In April of 1966, Marshall Bidwell retired as the director of Carnegie Music Hall. In the center here, you can see the program of in May of 19, uh, May 14th of 1967, Paul Koch was the organist, and it was the 3,000th performance at the Carnegie Music Hall North Side. The Tuesday Musical Club has started a division for woman organists. Another congratulations goes out to um, in the fall of 1968 for uh, uh, Donald Wilkins. He passed both not only the AAGO, but the choir master's exam. At this time, um, when Dr. Lord was the dean, he started two new history committees. Now, this history committee was a little bit different. It was looking at all the remaining old track or organs that were in the city of Pittsburgh. And also, the other committee was the organ service playing certificate. At this time, our membership was close to 400, 400 people. Um, in May, we, in March, we featured the, the finalists of our Young Organist Competition. One of the new judges you may, you may know, Mrs. Lou Steele, she had been in Pittsburgh for approximately two years and was a Fulbright scholarship from 1962 to 64 and studied with Longley and Andre McCaw. Dues at that point were only $10 and $2 for subscribers. Dr. Uh, Robert Sutherland Lord was invited uh, to serve as the Western Pennsylvania chairman at Nationals two, for two years after succeeding Franklin Watkins. We had a new uh, chapter member for transfer, and her name was Joyce Strobel. Kudos go to, in January of 1970 to Don Wilkins, who, owned, who earned his FAGO. 
He scored the highest record on his exam. Dr. Lord then was also named music critic for the American organist. In 1970, uh, April 3rd, Cas Dr. Casper Koch passed away. In 1970, we had 400 members. Dues were $15 for uh, regular members and $2 for subscribers and $1 for students. Jean ha Hancock was featured as the recitalist at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Butler. And the Pittsburgh Theater Organ uh, Society, also known as PESOS, uh, was founded and one of our members, Paul Engel, was their vice president. We have another new student uh, chapter that was founded on March 22nd in 1971. Dean uh, Wayne Galbraith presented the charter plaque to a no newly formed student chapter at Duquesne University. In January of 1972, Horace Hollister, our past dean, retired after 52 years of playing, and Dr. Donald Kettering retired after 25 years as music uh, director and organist at East Liberty Presbyterian Church. March meeting, uh, where we usually have our young organist competition, we had two young ladies that had won in 1971 playing. We had a young lady, Pat McAlway, who was a student of Don Wilkins, and Peggy Evans, who was a student of Russell Wilkins at Chatham. The Pittsburgh Concert Society has started to hold auditions for organ scholarships. On September 1st, 1972, Charles Huddleston Heaton started or as the organist and choir director at East Liberty Presbyterian Church. We have a new radio station in town. You may know it, WQED-FM. For the 1973 March competition, uh, the young organist winner was Keith Karachas, who's still a member of our chapter to this day. In January of 1974, Dr. Robert Sutherland Lord uh, did the Guild meeting on the life and works of French composer Charles Torme. Westminster College had another became um, another student chapter in April of 1974. In 1975, the regional convention was here, back in Pittsburgh. Here you can see in the center of the poster here, here's the convention booklet. This is, the, is Oakland, and here we have several of the days of the programs, including uh, Carnegie Music Hall, con including um, St. Paul's Cathedral and some of the other churches in Oakland. Here's Heinz Chapel and then uh, Bach, who's one uh, in the top corner over there, who is one of the figures that is on Carnegie Music Hall. In 1976-77, Lil McGregor served as dean of the chapter. Uh, jo uh, Jean Lanelet was made honorary member of the Pittsburgh chapter. In one of, a, one of our new uh, adventures with the Pittsburgh AGO was a combination with WQED and AGO, Music in Pittsburgh. It aired on Friday nights at 8 p.m. It repeated on Sundays at 3 p.m. And Ann Steele was the chair, assisted by Dr. Heaton, Dr. Lord, Dr. Wickman. The group planned to uh, play music of the different Pittsburgh organs, which were were programmed every week for a month for every three months. Our beloved Paul Engel would tape all the concerts and then give it to Marty from WQED. Paul Engel also, if you were studying for your exam to send to New York would come, he would tape uh, your exam and he also taped several of our concerts and recitals that we had. In 19, in, April of 1977, there was an organ crawl. 
St. Benedict the Moor Church, St. Luke's Episcopal Church, um, Rodolf Shalom, and the Swedenborg Church in the north side were part of uh, the organ crawl. Robert Page le led a two-day workshop uh, to conclude uh, the 1977 uh, season um, on polishing church music after Nerth were learned. In December 18th of 1977, the Rodolf Shalom Temple uh, had a special service to celebrate Charles Pearson's 53 years of service, and he was or organist emeritus at that point. A special event occurred in January of 1978. It's Shadyside Presbyterian, oh, I'm, I apologize, I got the wrong date, can I just? Shadyside Presbyterian Church hosted the March 27th meeting. Last year's competition winners were to perform. You may know them. Bob Trager and David Hart. Two uh, a two-organ special competition using both organs at Shadyside. First place was Bob Trager, who was the 1977 graduate of CMU and a student of Don Wilkins. And the second place was David Hart, Chatham College student, a student of Russell Wickman, and piano of Henry Spinelli. Tuesday musical scholarship winner where he directed the choral division. What a performance. And here's the, here's the um, program from it. In December of 1978, the Christmas party was held at Hartwood Acres. Uh, touring of the mansion occurred. Uh, program of early music was directed by Stan Tag, and yes, there was English dancing, which was uh, led by Franklin Watkins. Um, and then the final dean, er, I'm sorry, the, the final closing meeting of May of 1979 was a hymn sing under the direction of W. Thomas Smith, who was the executive director of the Hymn Society of America. I want to thank you all for allowing me to share 30 years of our history. There, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much, so much more to share with you. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I'm Barbara McElway, and I will be talking about the 1980s, 90s, and the first, <clears throat> excuse me, decade of the 2000s. The deans for the 80s were Lee, Lee Kohlenberg, spring 1980, Donald Wilkins, 80-82, Harriet Hargis, 82-84, Raymond Ocock, 84-86, George Tutwiler, 86-88, and Barbara McElway, 88-90. In these 30-some years, the Pittsburgh chapter took on several projects that made it known to the AGO nationally, as well as locally. The first of these is the Organ Artist Series a concert series that actually began in its planning stage with, with committee meetings in 1978. The chapter voted on the plan after hearing and studying the proposal. It passed by a very narrow margin. The committee members were Ann Labunsky, who is also Ann Steele, the chair, Russell Wickman, Louis Steele, Margaret Evans, Gregory Gilsdorf, Barbara McElway, and Dean Lee Kohlenberg, ex officio. We also received seed money, which we pay, were able to pay back the winter of 1981. Originally, the concert year was going to be from January to December, but we added two concerts to the first season to make it like most concert seasons. The programs were four concerts a year, two in the fall, two in the spring, and were Sunday evenings at 8 p.m. at Calvary Episcopal Church. Dr. James Hunter wrote excellent program notes. Marilyn Mason was the first artist, the perfect beginning of something exciting and new. After several concerts, Hugh and Alice Young volunteered to house the artists. They had the perfect house in Squirrel Hill, plenty of room and very comfortable and they did this for many years. Wanting to encourage young organists, we made a policy that one program a season 
will be a young organist. Some returned later in their careers as well-known performers. It also works out for chapter programming to have the artist stay over and be the program for a chapter meeting. There have been some changes through the years. We now perform in more venues, often collaborating with the church with the program that has music programs. We are stable financially. This is a picture of Calvary Episcopal Church where we began the series. We celebrated the 25th anniversary May 2004 in Heinz Chapel with the work we commissioned. Excuse me. We commissioned from Pittsburgh composer Glenn Rudolph, which included choir. The organist was Richard Elliott. The conductor was Brady Allred with part of the Bach Choir of Pittsburgh. And this shows a picture of Brady and Glenn and Richard. A concert that received lots of publicity was one that featured Michael Barone, host of the radio program, Pipe Dreams, with six P Pittsburgh or Pittsburgh-related organists performing Pittsburgh or Pittsburgh-related music on November 7, 2004, in Shadyside Presbyterian Church, which you can see was filled. Two years ago, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Organ Artists series in 2018 and 2019. Now let's go back to the decade of the 80s. We also held a regional convention in 1987, a convention with a point. There was construction going on downtown with the subway across to the north side, so we used the Pittsburgh Green Tree Marriott for the hotel. Harriet Hargis was the convention coordinator she and her committee planned a very good convention. There was a lot of variety in the programming, lots of churches, wonderful music, recitals and other concerts, workshops, beautiful worship, a gateway clipper cruise, and the final concert was the Greg Smith Singers. Deans for the 90s were Barbara McElway, spring 1990, Dr. David Billings, 1990 to 92, Carolyn Ferguson Slaw, 1992 to 94, Larry Marietta, 1994 to 1995, C. John Thickey, 1995 to 97, Joyce Moon Strobel, 1997 to 99, and R. Craig Dobbins, 1999 to 2001. The summer of 1990, Pittsburgh hosted a POE, Pipe Organ Encounter. There had been two in 1998, one in 1999, which were quite small because there had not been much publicity. But Anne Labunsky knew what one was and decided there was going to be one in Pittsburgh. She put together a committee and we started working. There was plenty of lead time for all the necessary advertising. By two weeks before day one, there were more than 100 kids coming, teenagers. We had to find more teachers, had to figure out how each student would get enough time at the organ. It was fortunate that we had Anne because she knows so many people everywhere. There were 145 students all together. It was housed at Duquesne University. Most of the teachers stayed in the dorm, were not paid. Quite a few teachers came from out of town. It was a great week and hectic. We walked down the hill to downtown every day, got on the subway for a one-stop ride, which the kids loved, had classes, went to workshops, heard different programs. There were some visits to other churches, lectures, back up the hill for lunch, and then to lessons which were in churches all over the place. A few teachers had to juggle three or four students. School buses were used for transportation. There was a cruise on the Gateway Clipper, very little free time on purpose. Most of the students played in a recital on the last day. Some of the kids wanted to stay another week. The following week was a national convention in Boston 
and news of our POE had really traveled. It became apparent several years later that the Pittsburgh POE was the beginning of the success of that program. We had another POE the following year, but we limited the number, suggested that the students should have had some training and raised the cost. We had 57 students. Each teacher had two students, which was ideal. There was more time for everything. One of the student favorites was seeing the insides of an organ, seeing how it all works, and with several organs, it was possible to walk through the organ. The closing recital was excellent. I digress a little here. Not all the students become organists, but they all gain a love and appreciation for the instrument. Several years later at a national convention, a young man came over to me, reintroduced himself, and told me how much he loved that week in Pittsburgh. He continued taking lessons, but now is a broker on Wall Street and plays organ in a small church in Brooklyn. He says that's what keeps him sane. Others have gone on to study, have church and teacher jobs, a full or major recitals. Recitalists all have made lasting friendships. The PO Green program is one of the AGO's major successes nationally. We hosted a regional convention in June 2023, 1999. John Walker was the convention coordinator. The hotel was the Ramada Plaza Suites, now a Hilton Garden Inn on Bigelow Boulevard across from U.S. Steel Building. It was a convention chock full of everything. It would take too long to name everything, but one thing that was beginning to show up in conventions was more attention to young students. There were several programs where students performed and were parts of workshops. There was more money than usual left out over after the convention. We wanted to put it to good use. It's now time for a new century, the 2000s. Deans for the next 10 years were Craig Dobbins, spring of 2001, Cynthia Pock, 2001-3, to three, Mark Nuremberger, 3-5, to five, J. Thomas Taylor, 5-7, to seven, Donald K. Fellows, 7 to 9, and Larry Allen, 2009 to 11. During this time, there was a POE Plus for adults and a POE which were hosted by the Duquesne chapter with the collaboration of our chapter as well. Back to the remaining convention money. It was decided to start a scholarship program for students. Begun in 2000 and named Pipe Organ Academy, or POA. It is a program that has three divisions. Number one for beginners, number two continuing organists, and number three for adults who are either beginners or wanting to improve. All categories require an audition, but be beginners may audition on the piano. Teachers are chapter members. This program has been quite helpful for all. This is a photo of a group of teachers and students. They play for different AGO meetings, chapter meetings, usually in April and May. And this is another group of teachers and students playing a different year. Here, th these are two alumni of POAs, Jeremy Jellick and Daniel Ficari, and they played for part of one of our uh, recent meetings. They're both in college now. And here is a master class that John, where John Walker was working with uh, Jeremy Jelinek. And we put in uh, a POA alumni uh, who won the Pittsburgh Concert Society organ competition in January of 2005 with his teacher, Ann Labunski. We have quite a few, I have purposely not mentioned meetings in these three decades. In going through the years in the archives, I realized 
there are many different kinds of meetings with kinds and subjects always, often repeated, but always presented differently depending on the presenter. And our own members are quite talented and will present or collaborate with programs as well. We have a few members, we, yeah, we have quite a few members recital, members recitals. In, Dean installation programs are also very uh, inspiring. This is a picture of, of the new officers when Larry Allen became Dean. For those programs, former deans, uh, we, we have gotten in the habit of having former deans dress if they especially take part in the procession and then uh, uh, can have a picture taken later. And this is a photo of all former deans with the exception of, I can't remember who that dean was, with the exception of the dean and we're all kind of there uh, around our flag. We have lots of choir programs, adult and children, occasional organ crawls, lectures, workshops. We also travel. Uh, you heard <coughs> Susan talk about where we travel. This was taken, we also have some joint meetings this is a photo taken from a joint meeting in Wheeling with the Wheeling chapter. Every once in a while, the National AGO will have a special idea for a meeting or program. October 19, 2008 was the day for an organ spectacular concert. And this shows Don Fellows and George Knight holding the organ spectacular sign and the organist for the occasion was Joe Joseph Nolan. Almost all our meetings include dinner. I want to mention the deans for the last <clears throat> 10 years, Larry Allen, spring 2011, Dr. Ann Labunski, 2011 to 13, Dr. Allen Lewis, 2013 to 15, Dr. Edwin, Edward Allen Moore, 2015 to 17, Doug Starr, 2017 to 19, and Chaz Bowers, our president, our present dean. Also, we hosted a very fine regional convention in 2015. Larry Allen was the coordinator. Every year, the AGO presents the Distinguished Artist Award to a very deserving, deserving member. The 2019 award went to John Walker, and John chose Pittsburgh for his recital and celebration. Officers, members, and friends came from everywhere. The recital award and reception were Friday, April 26th at Shadyside Presbyterian Church, and our chapter helped sponsor the event. Thank you for your attention, and have a great day. Thank you, Frank, Susie, and Barbara, for your enlightening and entertaining presentations and for the research that you have accomplished. There is so much more to be discovered about our chapter in the archives here at the Heinz History Center. It is our hope that the diligent and thoughtful work of our guild members will continue to bear fruit and acknowledged when the AGO chapter gathers to celebrate our 200th year. Thank you for joining us today and hope that you will join us for future gatherings and events.
that was a wonderful program. We want to thank each and every one of you for helping us so much to put this together. We have uh, Barbara McElway, Susie Gilliland, and Frank Curry with us tonight. We're delighted to be here um, and, and, to, and to really celebrate this anniversary with you. Um, thank you so much for listing your questions in the comments below the video. And I'm happy to relay them to our presenters. First, I'd like to kind of know your thoughts. Um, tell me about the process. Obviously, we had the Heinz History Center, which is a wonderful thing that we set up. But what other sources were you able to acquire besides the Heinz History Center in doing this project? Well, if I could speak first, it, it was tough because with the pandemic, uh, so many places were closed to us. A great resource would have been the music division of Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. We couldn't get into it. I work in Pitt. I should have been able to get into Pitt's music library. It was closed to our research. Morris Demon had material there yet. Uh, other collections elsewhere could have been great. Thank goodness that decision was made, and thank and Norris Stephen bless him and uh, his work Tutwine, of course. Uh, the History Center, thanks to Susie's intervention, was able to provide us with a rich array of materials going back to the beginning. If it weren't for the History Center, our chapter archives being there, we would be lost. So. Thank goodness, that was our one and only main source, besides newspapers. I mean, I bought newspapers.com so I could go to chapter accounts uh, meetings with someone in the past. So, combined with the great riches of the internet and what's available on the World, World Wide Web these days and physical materials in the chapter archives, we had plenty. We could have done hours of, of programs tonight. <laughs> you would have been watching until midnight. <laughs> Very good. So we have some questions here. Um, not to put any of you in the hot seat. How many conventions in total has the Pittsburgh chapter hosted? National versus regional? We had one national convention that was held in 1936. Uh, the booklet for all the conventions, um, minus the 99 and the 2015 conventions, are available at Library and Archives at the Heinz History Center. So the national convention that we held was in 1936 here. We had conventions, um, the regional convention started in the early 60s according to nationals. Uh, they, before that they had uh, biannual conventions of the different little regions and we held several of them every other year. Um, in the records we have some of the programs at Heinz History Center in the 1950s. Uh, 1965 we had a regional convention 1975 we had a regional convention, 1987, 1999, and then 2015 they were all regionals. Wasn't there one other time that we almost had a national convention? They had looked at, when I was doing some work in the archives, we uh, had gotten asked to look about being uh, the national convention back in the 1960s. And in 1964 we lost the bid to the city of Cleveland, Ohio. Think that has to do with any football rivalries? I have no idea. <laughs> and by the way, we also lost our first planned convention to Cleveland. The 1933s to be in Pittsburgh, well, we, we tried for it but lost to Cleveland, but we did have the 36 three years later. Don't worry, Cleveland, we still love you. Good, good. Okay, how many members, this is a good question, do we have at the chapter's smallest, and how many do we have at the chapter's largest? Probably the smallest. I'm, I'm guessing here. Yeah. You know, would take sure, this off. Sure. But I, you would think the, uh, the the charter group of 30 members may have been the smallest. Sure. It could have dipped after that. I'm an authority on the numbers there. Largest. Largest um, occurred approximately 1968 to 70s. We had over 400 members um, in the chapter. That would include the regular members, the uh, subscriber men members, and the student members, and goal members. I happen to know that they included all of this together. So here's another interesting question. How many steps are there up to the St. Paul Cathedral <laughs> loft? We need, Don, we need to phone a friend and we'll, and we'll invite Don Fellows onto the show tonight. Does anyone know? I know because I did the research for <laughs> <laughs> When we had the um, Von Beckerath uh, concert, 
And then shortly after that, we had a guild meeting there, and Paul Cope was the organist at that point. And there's 41 steps up to the, uh, at that time, there's 41 steps. I haven't been up there to count, uh, but there's 41 steps up to the lawn in the back. Nice, thank you. All right, here's another good one. How many student organizations are we affiliated with? Well, right now we're just affiliated with the 10, but we're the other ones that you mentioned. It, as this uh, chapter history went on, our first one was with South um, Area Butler High School, which was under Dr. Lamont Kirk. Then the uh, next uh, division was at we had a Westminster College in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania, um, with Ray Ocock, who was a member until he passed away a couple years ago, and then Duquesne Chapter. And we also have the POA, right? There's the Pipe, that's Pipe Organ Academy, yeah. which is different than... It is different. Uh, th 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 those yeah. are student, AGO student chapters, and there's the Pipe Organ Academy that teaches not only students, but also adults. And when was the Pipe Organ Academy founded, do you know? 19, uh, 2000. Oh, wow. Okay. Nice. Yeah, the year after the 99 convention. This is an interesting question. Any idea where people from Pittsburgh end up? Where do people from Pittsburgh end up? Well, one of the uh, things that's been interesting that uh, we've been doing is we went back, we were looking to update the, the past dean list. Sure. And there were two on there that, one that uh, Mark that he was deceased, but so my, I let my fingers do the walking and Barbara did the email letter and um, We found some of our deans where the where they're located um, I sent a, a note to Larry and Marietta. He's in California um, And I sent emails to uh, Lee Kohlenberg and Ken Axelson and they sent back very very nice letters telling a little more about themselves and then uh, you know just nice to be acquainted with them again. And where are they at now? Uh, Lee is, excuse me, Lee is in South Carolina, and uh, Ken Axelson is in North Dallas in Texas. Good. Now, I don't know if you'll know this, and I don't know this offhand. How many work at the national level? You mean the national office? Yeah. Well, there's not very many people there right now because of the pandemic. <laughs> she had a good answer to that. It, it, it does say inside the TAO. It, it does. does. Yes. yes. And, and uh, when I was chair of the uh, Committee on the New Organist, I was there once a year in New York, sometimes for meetings, just sometimes I was in New York and I went over to the, to the offices. And I think maybe on a normal day or something like that, there might have been between eight and ten people there. Okay. Thank you. All right, now, some really good questions here. What, what, I feel like everyone should answer this question. What is the most surprising thing that you found out about our chapter? And why is it surprising? I think something else wanted to be that one. I, I actually, I joined when I was a student. Then, then Carnegie Tech. And I joined in um, 1958, I guess. So there have been a lot of years there, and I really can't think of a quick answer to that <laughs> question. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I it was interesting to see. I guess the thing that impressed me the most, uh, the thing that really got to me, was how big the chapter thought from the very beginning. I mean, here there are barely formed a small uh, number of uh, organists. Not much experience under the belt as, as far as running the organization, who knows what kind of treasury they had. And here after that, they're inviting Marcel Dupre <laughs> to do the of Pittsburgh. I thought they were thinking big, and, and then they did get major people over those uh, first decades and beyond, too. But uh, I was quite impressed with uh, that. And uh, also the, the diversity of the program. It's not only uh, major organists, and of course the programs by own, their own members in, in, in churches in, in the area, but uh, it wasn't always a music program for members meetings. Uh, they would invite speakers, uh, a professor from Carnegie Institute of Technology, now Carnegie Mellon, to speak about the uh, acoustics of, of organ music. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, the most notable lecturer 
the my course in the first third was the, the, the uh, great art architect uh, Ralph Adams Cram addressing the guild in East Liberty Presbyterian Church, one of the greatest buildings in his whole career. I mean, that's I'd love to have been there, to be present for that. So, yeah, big thinking all those times. What about the two of you? What's the most notable program, either from what you researched or what you've experienced personally? Well, the, um, I did 1950 through uh, 1979. And what I thought was really neat is not only did uh, we went to uh, the different organ manufacturers, Sean's, Bowler's, and, um, but we also went to different churches, learned um, about uh, the different programs that they had. We went to the Greek Orthodox Church, we went to some of the different synagogues that we had. They, we were very um, diverse, a diverse group, and, and we were learning different things. I thought that was great. There was so much, there's a ton of information in the section that I did. Um, there, I had to do several edits, but it's it's wonderful to see how active the, the chapel is. Robert, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I I guess because it's always been a part of me, I haven't really you know <laughs> uh, thought about that that much. However, I have learned through the, the the period of time that I was chair of the national committee that not that many chapters have been as fulfilling as this. Hmm. And uh, there are chapters that do not have a meeting every month. We might have two or three a year. Um, and there, I, I think that there are also chapters that don't have some of that close meeting. And a lot of that has to do with numbers. That's a wonderful thing. When I was on the phone with Elizabeth George, we, the last time that I spoke with her, she was looking up our chapter membership to see the age groups that we have. And she said, we really are about split. And that's a really healthy and yeah. really good thing mm -hmm. to see. It's interesting on, when we were watching this to know that dinner prices were an item of contention even in the 1920s. So that's nothing new, nothing to be alarmed about, but everything we see is. Well, and as the other thing that surprised me was for that one, everybody got five tickets to sell. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I don't think that girl did today. <laughs> and looking, speaking of dinner prices, even back, looking back into the 30s, uh, you know, and even today, dues are even a, a were an issue. People paying their dues. There were numerous times of, you know, remember to pay dues. Um, when Lester Carver was uh, the treasurer, uh, he said, "These here are the people that belong to the Angel Club uh, for those that had paid the dues." Um, and I just chuckled because some of the problems are, that we had back then are still uh, hanging out every once in a while. Well, I want to thank the three of you for the research that you did. It, it's, it's insurmountable. I mean, what a wonderful thing that you've given to our chapter. It's a real gift. And I know that history is ongoing. So, you know, we're making history tonight. I think it's safe to say that the AGO has never had a TV show, um, <laughs> you know, in its past before. And um, I know that that's one of the items that we were talking about. We're looking for some things that we couldn't find, right? Yes. Uh, for instance, the only the one thing I'd love to see in the archives would be the uh, the minute book from 1936 to 1942. I mean, it's it's missing. Uh, I believe I'm hoping it's out there somewhere. And someone comes across it in an attic in, in amongst library books. Uh, but that and, and plus, don't throw anything away regarding chapter history if you have among your own sessions or know of anybody. I mean, uh, anything's fair game to be donated to the archives to supplement, complement what already exists. And Susie, you were looking for some things as well. Yes, so if you have anything, anything at all that deals with the chapter history, chapter archives, if you were a chapter officer and still have your notebook, um, we would love to have everything. Uh, what will happen is it will go to the Heinz History Center and add on to our collection that we have there. We The collection was um, donated in 2009. Um, on Larry Allen, not part of our chapter, because Larry was dean at that point. But um, we have very few um, 
newsletters from 2009 forward. We don't have any of the minute books. I would love for you to give me a call. Um, the chapter has my uh, uh, phone numbers and emails. Uh, we would love to have it to continue because it was such a wonderful thing that um, Nora Stevens and Mary Weber and Franklin Watkins and all um, of the other folks back in the 70s that started uh, the uh, historical committee. We can't lose this information. It's, it's our chapter and it's our chapter history. So please um, get them to me and I will make sure they get to the history center. Good. I think we just brought you a bunch of newsletters. Have you yes. had any fun with those yet? Have you I have. Them through them? I have. I have. That's all recent history. Uh, also, um, there are a lot of resources at the Music Library, at the um, Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh. Um, I did email them. Um, I got one response back because of COVID, they were closed. But if you need oral histories and things, that's where you would look. And feel free to contact any of us and we'll let you know where you can find other information and resources. Cool. I would like to just close by thanking the three of you one more time, Barbara, Susie, and Frank, for your wonderful work. I know you'll receive a bunch of emails and things, but thank you so much. What a gift to our chapter, especially this is a historic thing, and uh, what a wonderful, wonderful tribute. I also want to make sure that we thank our sub-dean, Ken Danchi. He's watching this from home tonight. Um, he worked a, a tremendous amount of time and, and put a tremendous amount of time into preparing this program, along with Postscript Productions uh, with Carolyn and Colin, and, and, and they did a lot in the editing. We also want to thank the Heinz History Center. They've, you know, housed these records for you know what, 10, 11 years now, and um, and they continue to add to our collection. We also want to thank John Tillian for hosting us here tonight in his lovely house, and Aaron Sproul. They've also been in the in, in the other room working on all of the technology and making all of this happen. Um, and finally, we want to thank Regina Kettering. She's the one filling us your questions, which I'm reading off of this iPad. So we're really high tech here at uh, the Tillian residence. Um, and finally, in closing, I'd like to just say that I was on a Zoom call with the National um, Board of the National Officers, and someone made the comment that you'll be American Guild chapter of organists, not organs. And how true it is that when we talk about our history and we look at all of these wonderful things, that it's done by organists. Um, playing some really wonderful and fine instruments here in Pittsburgh, but it's all about the organists. And you see all of the people, including all of you, who have your fingerprints all over this organization. It's so neat to see that so many of these traditions that began in the 1920s of having the chapter dinner or having a chapter field trip in the 1950s, it's not stuff that just started happening yesterday. And it's so wonderful for us to be able to be here now all together and to celebrate this wonderful tradition that unites us with those people from then. So I hope that you will be happy, um, even though we can't be together, I hope you'll be happy to celebrate this 100th year in this unique way. Um, and I hope you'll join us next uh, um, October 28th, it's next month, Monday, October 28th, at seven o'clock, right here again on YouTube and on Facebook, as we get um, really to go on a program we would otherwise never be able to go on together. And that's to tour the Carnegie Hall um, Skinner Organ. So Monday, October 26th, I'm sorry, Monday, October 26th, I think I said the 28th at 7 o'clock. Anyone else have anything to add? All right, well, viva la org. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.